Hello, everyone. This is David Solomon with CoBuzz, and welcome to CoBuzz Thursday Live. Glad to have you with us. We have got a really interesting show today. As typically they are, we are getting some really, really neat people on the show, and uh, today's certainly no exception. Today we're going to have um, a really, really beloved person in this industry. Uh, he's got a kind of a small speaker company, but he's just the, the neatest guy and makes some of the most wonderful sounding uh, uh, speakers that I've ever heard. Uh, it's John DeVore from DeVore Fidelity. That's who we'll have. So uh, we'll, we'll, we'll welcome John in, in just a few minutes. We've also got um, on today's show, we'll have Sujan Hong on, and she'll be talking about the um, some of the new releases that we're going to see tomorrow. That's always a really, really fun segment. And uh, before we get started with John, I'll just tell you a little bit about CoBuzz. Uh, we've got over 60 million tracks now. Um, this is really cool because it started out at around 40 million. And people were calling us all the time going, oh, gosh, that's great, except you don't have this or you don't have that. And and, and it's so many times, all this is is just waiting for the ingestion period. It takes a long time to ingest, ingest these files. But we've gone from... Uh, from 40 to over 60 million uh, tracks these days. So it's really getting a whole lot closer to the other services. At some point, we'll be caught up all the way if we're not already. Um, Cobus does have a download store too. And if you happen to be the kind of um, person who likes to either uh, own your own um, music or if you're like in my position, I, I like to have the music uh, available uh, because I like to support the, I like to support artists and I don't really have a big reason to buy CDs these days. I do buy albums from time to time. Uh, but this is such a great way to support, uh, artists that are on streaming because streaming doesn't pay a lot. Uh, these guys have, you know, really almost have to reinvent themselves frequently. Well, like a lot of us do in, in different businesses, but the download store, I can tell you, helps a lot and they they appreciate it uh, anytime you do. We stream up to 24192 in FLAC, so you don't need any kind of a, a special DAC or any kind of a setup. You pretty much any DAC these days will do at least 24192. Um, so it's really, really easy to play back these high resolution files. And if you haven't heard the difference, we've got a 30-day trial for you to, to try the difference between, say, a lower resolution service like a, oh, a Spotify or uh, Apple Music or those kinds of things. Um, if you just go back and swap back and forth, this doesn't take a whole long time to, to decide if, if high res is, is right for you. If you're a casual listener, probably not for you if you're just a background listener but if you really love music and you uh and you're very attentive when you're listening to it and you, and you really want to hear every last detail uh we got it for you so uh you can also um enter once you do uh sign up you can get you can get in to code Butts for about 15 dollars a month if you're an individual uh, or about 12, uh, let's see, I think it's around 12.50 a month if you pay uh, annually. And then also, um, we've got a family plan that we just started out too. And now you can get up to six members on your family for only like $25 a month. Um, here's a really cool thing. Get your kids on high resolution. Don't even say much to them. Uh, then let them try Spotify in another three months or six months. There is a huge difference. And once you um really get into what this is all about once you start hearing parameters that you really don't think about if you're a real hard mp3 guy try to go back after six months you'll hear a difference even on bluetooth even though that's really low resolution i just did this uh experiment for my wife yesterday so we uh we certainly hope you'll you'll join us there's another section that john just hopped on um just uh either this morning, I think it was just this morning, John just sent us, uh, John DeVore, the guy that we're going to have on the, the uh, show in a second, uh, John just sent us this absolutely fantastic um, playlist, but we've got playlists of so many partners, and you just would not believe how eclectic these playlists are. I listen to every single one of them. Most of them I really, really like a lot. Some of them to me are, you know, it's just not my thing. But it's really neat to see the company's different personalities. And I think you'll be able to see John's uh, personality uh, quite well uh, as as we bring him on. So uh, without further ado, Mr. DeVore. Hi. How are you doing, buddy? 
I'm doing good. How are you doing, man? Really good to have you on the show. I've been wanting to, uh, I've actually been wanting to have you on since the very beginning. You know, we only started doing these things a few months ago. And there are certain people that you, that have made an impression in your life, uh, you know, through shows or whatnot. And you certainly uh, have made one on me. And I think most everybody in the audio industry that just sort of digs what we do. Uh, you're one of those guys that just, there's no doubt that you just dig what you do. It's true. Uh, I'm glad it shows. <laughs> I don't know what I would be doing if I wasn't doing this. So yeah, I appreciate it. Thanks. So, uh, so John, there's a lot of people that, that, you know, you're, you're cottage, you're basically a cottage, uh, speaker company. It's not, it's not huge. It's mm -hmm. not, you know, like, uh, world known. It's certainly world renowned, but it's not necessarily world known. And I wanted to introduce our, um, our, uh, fans to you because we kind of think this would be, you know, really cool for them to, to know about you. Mm -hmm. So, so tell us, John, um, we we'll we'll get into the speakers on, in a little while, but how did you even get into this? I mean, I know you've been into this this industry a long time. How did you get your start into the industry, and what uh, what prompted you to say, you know, these speakers out there aren't to my liking? I want to do something myself. It was uh, okay. Well, I, I have been a an audiophile since I was a little kid. I, I grew up in a family filled with musicians, so uh, we all chose our our, uh, our various instruments. My mother was a classical pianist, and so my little sister chose cello, and so there was a perfect little match there. I chose trumpet, so I would sit there and blare away in one side of the house, and my mom would run to the other side of the house, so it, it didn't really last very long. So I immediately switched over to recorded music. And um, I was the kid all through elementary school and through high school who made mixtapes, actual cassettes uh, for all my friends. I had the speakers positioned up um, even in, in middle school. I had them position, positioned up for best imaging. Uh, I built my first pair of speakers when I was in college because uh, I couldn't afford the speakers that I liked in the hi-fi stores that I would just waste everyone's time in. Uh, and actually I got credit for it. I was, a, I, I went to art school, so I got credit for the, for the speakers. Um, and then right after, right out of art school in 1988, I moved to New York city and was broke and was walking down Broadway. And I saw a help wanted sign in a hi-fi shop. I went in and, uh, and that's it. So I, uh, that was, um, that was Stereo Exchange. Oh, Dave Wasserman. That was Dave Wasserman. Yeah, that was his original, not original. It was the second location, but it was a tiny little hole in the wall uh, closer up to where Tower Records used to be. Uh, and it was it was all used gear. It was an, just an incredible collection of used gear. And um, yeah, that's from right. that's the way Stereo Exchange started out, right? Oh, yeah, it was all used. He had a few lines that he sold new. Um, not right around the time that I got in in 88 in the late 80s he had opened up a second uh it was like on the third or fifth floor it was a second uh showroom where he had some high-end audio new brands and at that point he had he had Apogee and Duntech and Threshold there's some great stuff in there so this was like what early 80s this was late 80s late 80s okay yeah, yeah. um but I worked in the used department so I was messing around with you know, Macintosh and Altex and crazy Hartfield subwoofers. And I mean, there was a whole, there was a whole, uh, I mean, it was, yeah, it was, it was an amazing education. I got to like hear just whatever anybody brought in. You had to be up, become an expert on it. I heard everything. Yeah. I mean, I heard all the high end brands that we didn't carry. So I heard Krell and Levinson and everything. Um, I got to hear whatever combination I decided I wanted to, to mess around with, you know, weird early Carver speakers and, you know, um, beverage and I mean, really everything. <laughs> That's really cool. Yeah, it was amazing. And you went from there to you. you how long did you work for Dave at Stereo Exchange? Uh, off and on for almost 10 years. I left. Uh, I was sort of I was part time while I was kind of uh, doing other things as well in the city. And then in 96, I went to I went over across town to work for Andy Singer. So I went to Sound by Singer at that point. So you were selling some of the best gear in New York at that point. 
Yeah. Yeah. Or Andy certainly would have said so. That oh, certainly. <laughs> we, <laughs> if there's one thing Andy is not lacking in, it's uh, uh, a self of uh, self, uh, a sense of self worth. Andy is exactly. certainly, certainly there. Yeah. But hey, Andy listen, likes it. The best. It really was some of the best gear around. I mean, oh, it, it absolutely was. He was, yeah, it was, he was obviously, he was up there in that, in the, in the top tier with Mike K, you know, selling out of uh, Lyric. And yeah, it was, it was a, it was, it was I, when I realized actually Stereo Exchange was to some extent, but it was actually a tourist destination in the city for a lot of people. You know, weird audio files from Europe or, or Asia would show up at Sound by Singer with cameras just like, Whoa, you know, look at the look at the gear they've got on. Oh, you're Andy Singer. Oh, can I shake your hand? Yeah. So uh, it was a it was a interesting time. It was fun. I I could uh, I couldn't agree more. That that was a super super interesting time in audio, and you were really coming up uh, when some pretty amazing technology was being de developed in speaker. So if you went to work for Singer, did you open some? And you were opened in like early the early two thousands, wasn't it? Yeah, uh, I actually started it right at the end of 2000. So you were you were able to hang in that in that uh, environment for th three and a half four years. Uh, well, uh, yeah, oh yeah, in in Singer, yeah. I actually, so I started the company. Um, a friend of mine, a guy who actually met, uh, we worked together at um, at Stereo Exchange. This guy, Steve Michaud. He actually decided he wanted to start. This was the end of towards the end of the '90s. He wanted to start selling uh, these really cool old Sherwoods and Scott, these little vacuum tube integrated amps, these little vintage, you know, '60s, '70s uh, integrated amps, out of his home in Brooklyn. Um, but he didn't want to sell them with the the contemporary speakers, which would have been, you know, uh, Sirwin Vegas or Big Altex, because those tended to be, first of all in rougher shape, but also much larger, really not appropriate for most New York apartments. So at that point, I had, I had been building speakers already for a couple of decades. And at that point, um, I was like, hey, you know, I'll build speakers, at least speakers for you to demo the gear on. And if you sell any, fine, you know, I'll build them. I don't, I'll build them in my kitchen and, you know, whatever, it's fine. So that happened. Uh, so it was kind of like a soft start for the speaker company. And then Pretty quickly, Steve decided he wanted to open a storefront, and he opened In Living Stereo um, about four blocks away from Sound by Singer, where I was working. And I was like, so what are we going to do? Uh, so I actually I designed an act a, a full line of speakers, a little bookshelf speaker, a, sta a floor standing speaker, made these these quick and dirty brochures, and the, start, the speaker line started. And Andy didn't even know it. So I had a speaker line in his competitor and Andy didn't even know. I was still just part time. I was like, oh, that that artist musician guy, John, he breezes in. He sells a couple of big systems and breezes out again. You know, um, so one, it was started to get a little silly. You know, I was really it was it was playing with fire trying to pull one <laughs> over on Andy Singer. So the so one day after work, I took him out to Martini's across the street and uh handed him my brochure and he read it he put his martini down and he looked at me and he was like you started a speaker company and you didn't tell me <laughs> i was like i was ready to be fired i was you know whatever and he was like well we have to sell these right you know and i was like well i already have a dealer in new york <laughs> and he was like what is wrong with you so uh, yeah so the, my first two dealers were in living stereo and sound by singer I, what a couple of great dealers to have starting yeah. out. Wow. Yeah, no, it was great. And not long after that, I, I was, I, I left retail and, uh, you know, opened up a, an actual factory and yeah, took it, took it national and then eventually international. This is like one of the great stories at Hi-Fi. You and I were talking about this a couple of days ago uh, in, in that there are some really, really interesting audio companies in Brooklyn, New York. I mean, it's kind of turning into like the Cambridge of England, right? I mean, like there's right. a lot of people that are making some really nice stuff there. You got you guys and yeah. Grado. And, yeah, Grado's uh, been here forever. Ohm, Ohm Acoustics is in Ohm. the sort of edge of Long Island, Brooklyn. Yeah. And then MyTech is there. Yeah. And 
I mean, yeah, there's some really, really cool things happening in Brooklyn right now. Yep. And um, so one of the really cool things about about DeVore Fidelity is that you pretty much make things there, right? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, it's all built. We, we build it all in New York here in this in the factory in Brooklyn. We're in the Brooklyn Navy Yard. Um, we do all of our, our cabinets. The drivers are all designed and some are assembled here. Uh, but for the most part, they're actually the, all the drivers, the woofers and tweeters are built by Seos in Norway for us. Uh, to our oh, company. yeah. Yeah. Great company. Great yeah. company. I've used Seos drivers before. Uh, yeah. We've actually got a few pictures. Uh, I didn't mention this before. But and I should uh, throw credit where credit's due uh, with I'd like to thank Dan Matka for uh, for producing the show today. So, Dan, I'm, what I'm going to ask you to do is pull up some of the pictures that uh, John sent. Uh, there's a there's one there's a couple in particular um, that I'd like to, to, to show. One of them is just the, the basket of the driver. Um, right. so Dan, if you can, if you can pull that up, uh, these are all cast baskets. And when we say cast baskets, there's a lot of way to cast baskets. Right. Um, and can tell us a little bit about some people don't know why you should even, this is a, this is a, this is the metal that they're actually using to cast the baskets. And then you can right. go ahead and go a, ahead of slide to show them the actual, uh, basket, Dan, but tell us, uh, John, uh, what are the advantages to to casting a basket? I mean, that's a lot more expensive than buying a basket that you could just as easily, not, not just as easily, quite a bit easier stamp out of metal. And a lot of people do. Yes. Uh, well, cast, you can really specifically design the, the thickness and all of the shapes. You can make the, the, um, the rails and everything on the basket more aerodynamic. Uh, you can use different materials. There's not very many materials you can actually stamp. You really, you're pretty much limited to uh, steel of some sort. Um, casting. So we got into casting. Originally, we were we've always used cast cast baskets, uh, and we started out using the the Seos cast zinc baskets for everything. Yeah, and those aren't bad either. No, they're great. They're great baskets. Um, but for the O reference, this is a, a new flagship speaker that, that we released last year. Uh, I wanted to, I basically, I didn't want to, I didn't want to leave anything on the table. I wanted to explore every possible uh, avenue to maximizing the performance of the, of the speaker. So rather than just go with the off the shelf zinc, uh, cast zinc basket, I was like, well, we need to, I want to address the baskets. There's, there's things that I want to change in the shape of the basket. Yeah, hold on. Before you keep going, John, let, let's get Dan to switch this to an actual speaker basket. <laughs> yeah, this is a this is a machined aluminum uh, heat sink for another different project. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, Dan, it's the ones that sort of look like a speaker with no uh, with no uh, cone on them. Uh, yeah. Sorry to interrupt. They're, Don. they're uh, gold. They're gold color. They're um, they're made out of cast bronze. There should right. be. Um, so, so keep keep going. I'm sorry. Yeah. So, and I wanted to play with materials. So we ended up, um, we did a really rough and ready uh, prototype with cast bronze, and uh, just as a basically as a proof of concept, and they sounded incredible. I mean, even there we go. Yeah. So that that's so those are cast. So what we ended up doing with there's a we used a foundry in Indiana. Uh, that's used to doing, um, you know, uh, other than fine art sculptures, there's not a lot of stuff that's cast in bronze. Right. Some of the stuff that is, is like plumbing fixtures. You know, they use, they do a lot of casting in copper and bron uh, brass and bronze and things like that. Yeah, these are, these are the roughs. So we went, we found this foundry and we, we, are, we get them sand cast. So the, these are the, these are the rough, rough and ready prototypes. Yeah. The image just before, those are the actual sand casts. So we do sand casting, which is a process where we machine a mold, which is essentially an inverse version of what the end what we end, want to end up with. Yeah, those are the those are the rough castings. And then that mold is pressed into um, these these bins of sand uh, with like a medium to keep it firm. And then that basically makes a mold. I mean, they used to make engine blocks this way, things like that. And then they pour in the, the molten metal, in this case, bronze. 
uh, and we get a very accurate casting. Uh, and then what those guys, yeah, there we go. These are, these are fresh. So these are the guys in the background. They're wailing on these big blocks of black sand. They're wailing on them with hammers, breaking away the sand molds and revealing what's in this bin here, which are my bronze baskets with these sort of nozzles. This is, this is the spout where the molten bronze is poured into. Um, yeah, so those are, those are my absolutely raw castings there in the bin. And then those get cleaned up and then they get machined to really fine tolerances. Uh, and then they're sent here. And then we actually ship them off in kits to Norway to Seos. And then Seos builds the, the final, the end result, the drivers uh, for us there. And then they ship back, back to us. I didn't, even know say, I didn't even know Seos would do that. That's, that's pretty, yeah. that's pretty yeah, awesome. There's, there's a bunch of the prototypes. There's some of the, some of the bronze ones, some of the ones before we did bronze, several. So you use several different. There. You use several different uh, materials before you uh, settled on bronze. Then, like you say, right? Uh, two different alloys. Yeah, I mean, aside from the the normal aluminum and zinc, we use two different alloys of bronze. Uh, we found one really early on that was that was great sounding, and it was going to be the one we went with, but it had uh, lead in it. Which meant that it would have it, which meant I wouldn't be able to sell those models in Europe. <laughs> so, oh uh, right, it very, right, right. Yeah, it was a very, it was a very old fashioned. It was like an original one of those lead recipes. Well, this must have been the time. This must have been in a transition period because there was a while there that you could, you could get it, you could use it, and you can still uh, get it and use it in the U.S. Uh, but you can't. Yeah, no, you I, like I, I built the prototypes with. Um, with that original alloy. Uh, so they went to say us and they came back to me, but if I was going to try to sell them as a product in Europe, it would be, I would have a problem. So oh, we yeah, found, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So we, then so, we had to keep, keep looking and we found an alloy with no lead that had all the same properties uh, as that original alloy. And that's, so that's what we did. And we got, you know, we got ingots made up of our alloy and then when we cast them, that's, you know, we make a hundred at a time. And um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's intense. <laughs> that's really cool. First off, I've never heard of anyone that, that's cast. I mean, there may be, but I don't think so. I've never heard of anybody casting their speakers out of bronze. That's gotta be crazy expensive. It's yeah, it's crazy expensive. Yes. Yeah. Um, I mean, the, the, the O reference project, it's, it's a very, very expensive speaker at retail. You know, people people are like you know how can you how many do you think you're going to sell and the answer is not very many um if if the bronze if the expense of doing all this bronze uh was supposed to be paid off by just selling the reference that's behind me there and it's this is this is the uh my office here at, at, at devor fidelity if i was hoping to just do it pay it off by just doing the o reference it would just it's a joke it, i would never ever recoup the costs of tooling up uh, so we are uh, going to bring the bronze parts into some new models that are going to fall in between the O reference and our existing uh, orangutan line. So that's stuff that we're working on right now. Yeah, for a company, uh, for the company of your size, any kind of efficiencies like that go a long way. Yeah, um, especially and, and efficiencies for us. I mean, like a company our size, efficiencies for us mean instead of making five, we make fifty. <laughs> There's never any hundreds or thousands <laughs> with with DeVore Fidelity, but yeah, it you know makes something. Me... There's a lot of there. There's a lot of people out there that dig the whole exclusive thing. There's not a lot of people that have these, but the people that do have them, uh, they're huge, huge fans uh, yeah. for obvious reasons. So, you know, when I first when Dan Matka when I first met Dan, uh, this was only you know a couple of years ago because we've been. Dan and I started just about the same time. I think I started like a month or so before Dan did. Right. Uh, so we, we, we've really pretty much been into this thing about the same time. And Dan and I didn't know each other. Uh, well, Dan was from the record industry, right? He he um, he did management and promotion, and he did this for years and years. And so I, I go to Dan, and I'm going, um, you know, you're a record guy. None of the record guys have got decent hi-fi none right. of them i mean right. it's like if they do somebody gave it to them right? right but most of the record guys they just you know they they listen to the records and then they move on to so i'm going so so tell me 
what do you have? And he's going, I can't remember the amp he got. I ended up getting him a, getting him a Hagel uh, 590, one of the big, you know, that will pull it's, your O ring out yeah, if you pick awesome. it up the wrong way. I mean, this thing sounds great. Right. And I'm, I'm going, so what kind of speakers do you have? Let's see, if that, or what kind of system do you have at the time? He's going, I've got this. Uh, I'm if I'm if I'm saying this right, I'm almost positive I am. He's got this Parasound preamp, Parasound preamp, which mm -hmm. is absolutely that's a great. They make great, great stuff. Yeah. And he's got hooked up some little 13 watt tube amplifier. I'm thinking, and and I'm going well. You know that that's cool. I'm starting to get my interest peaked. And I'm going well. What kind of speakers do you have? And I swear I thought he was going to say maybe something like, uh, I I didn't know what he was going to say. Right. He says. He says, uh, well, there's this little company that's not too far from me. Um, I got turned on to him a few years ago uh, by my brother-in-law, and they're called DeVore. And and he's going, you probably never heard of him. And I'm going, I love that guy. What I said, I have heard of him. I've, I've listened to tons of their speakers, and every, every single time I listen to them, they're just totally magic. There's just something about them that... Uh, um, they're sweet. They're lifelike. They image like a bear. Um, and they're just a lot of fun to listen to. And I had been wanting to get my hands on them for a long, long time because when I demo things, it's typically a little different and a little harder than mm -hmm. when most people demo things because it's just it's just what I do. And so every time I've had an opportunity to, I, I take them to their limit, but they seem to have uh, quite, quite yep. large limits. Yeah. In fact, Dan, I think, uh, had a set of your speakers in his, Hey, Dan, uh, bring up the, uh, bring up the picture of your, of your, uh, uh, system, uh, as of a couple of weeks ago. And then if you, if you, if you would come on line with us. Yeah. So this, oh, there is, we go. yeah. So this is Dan's, uh, system as of a few weeks ago. Um, and as you can tell, Dan is almost a big, as big of a vinyl nut yep. as, uh, as our friend, Mr. DeVore is. Hey, Dan. Hey guys, how are you? Hey, Dan. So, uh, so you Dan, okay? yeah, yeah. you great, man. So Dan has a, another set of the, of your speakers they are the smaller ones. I can't remember which ones they were, but they sounded great. Which ones were they, Dan? The Gibbon eight. I've got an old, old pair that uh, I've been using for many years, but I got to audition these uh, for, you know, it was probably the best week of my life. So to date, <laughs> was when I had these, I had, you know, they actually had to hire security guards to hold me down uh, <laughs> when they were taking these away. Have you ever seen that show Hoarders? Yeah. When like the person is like changing their mind, any excuse. It's like, hold on, let me just listen to one more thing. Uh, I these uh, sounded uh, unbelievable and you can see the Hagel uh, on the left. Yep. So, so I did, I, I, uh, I wouldn't have ordinarily done this, uh, especially for just some, some guy or some guy that was my boss or some guy that I work with. But Dan is like one of these, uh, he's like a real music lover. When I, whenever I go to Dan's house, the first thing we do, we head down to the system and we start listening to albums and this guy's got, the most eclectic uh, there's 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 three friends that have got that have got crazy eclectic uh collections you're one of them john uh dan's another one there's a guy in denver called and his name is phil murray's we're all really good friends but i mean I'm, i just i'm blown away with with all of your collections thanks for thanks for showing us that dan um but that's great I, that's that's amazing they look good in there that's a, a weird photo very wide angle but they look good in there yeah, well, you know, I, I had asked Dan before he put it down. You know, can you please can you please just take a picture of it? It was, a, it was a bad photo, and we had to doctor it up to make it even really intelligible. But it ended up looking yeah. pretty weird. But yeah, it really it happened. I did, I did really have the speakers. It wasn't a dream. Even the photo <laughs> looks like it was some kind of weird, dream, like, or like almost like an animated short of the speakers. Yeah. So I don't know that we can talk about the speakers in just a little bit. There's a couple of things I want to do uh, just before that. We're going to we're going to take a break for just a second and we're going to bring on our music merchandiser. So everybody hang out. John's going to be back and we're going to talk about some challenges of COVID and where where John sees the the industry and his company going. And, and we'll 
we'll be bringing uh, we'll be br bringing John back in just a little bit. For right now, I would like to uh, introduce our awesome music manager, Su Jan Hong. Hello, Su Jan. Hi, David. How are I'm you doing? Good. I'm doing well. I got to put uh, on these new microphone earbuds. Yeah, yeah. Okay, cool. We just got we're we're starting to work with this company called Sonic Presence out of uh, New York, and uh, th these are a couple of uh, uh, bi uh, panoral microphones that uh, the company just sent Sujan, and so this is literally the first time she was using them. But I'm going, you gotta get off that computer. <laughs> that computer microphone because it always sounds so terrible and you always have such interesting information i really want you to come you know i want you to come through uh as as, as good as possible so how are you doing uh, i'm doing fine david how are you busy week busy week they're all busy weeks yeah yep yep uh when we start to take off on a friday afternoon sujan never gets to if you ever see um almost anything special outside of just an album that's listed on our our setup like um uh, a whole lot of the playlists a lot of the panoramas a lot of this stuff that's what that's what sujan does so she's got one of these jobs that is absolutely never over uh you can't even scratch the surface of her job she's one of the hardest working people i know and we are so proud to have someone with such awesome music knowledge uh, on our team. So Sujan, I'm going to, I'm going to cut out because you're a whole lot more interesting when you start talking about music than anything else that we're doing here. So I'm going to leave and let you tell us what, uh, what's coming up. Thanks a lot right. for being here. Sounds good. All right. Hey everyone. So I'm here with a bunch of new picks for the week and starting off with our album of the week which is the 60th anniversary remastered reissue of John Coltrane's Giant Steps. So this was originally released in 1960, and it was Coltrane's first album as a leader for Atlantic Records. Um, and with this 2020 super deluxe version, you get 35 tracks in all. There's uh, eight alternate takes and 20 additional takes, um, and it's all available to stream and purchase in 2496. And then on the topic of Coltrane, um, you may have already seen the news if you follow Cobas on socials. Uh, we're thrilled to be co-hosting with Rhino Records, a live discussion next week to celebrate the album's enduring impact and influence. We've got like this amazing all-star panel um, assembled for uh, the event. It's uh, saxophonist Archie Shep, Lakeisha Benjamin, Melissa Aldana, and Shabaka Hutchings. Our co-moderators will be Coltrane historian and biographer Ashley Kahn, who wrote uh, the liner notes for this reissue, um, and musician and writer Greg Tate. So please join us on September 23rd, which is also Coltrane's birthday, um, at 4 p.m. Eastern. You can go and save the event on Facebook right now, on our page, on the uh, official Coltrane page, the Rhino Records page. Um, you're not going to want to miss this, and don't forget to check out the reissue tomorrow. Uh, my next pick is Thelonious Monk's Palo Alto. So this was originally supposed to come out over the summer, um, and it's finally getting its uh, release tomorrow. So there's a great backstory to this album. Um, in the fall of 1968, a 16-year-old kid named Danny Scher booked Thelonious Monk to play at his high school in Palo Alto, California. Um, Monk and his band were in town to play a two-week residency in San Francisco and were convinced by Cher to, you know, also play a show for, for you know, him and his classmates. Um, and it turns out a the uh, high school janitor recorded it. And so the tape sat in a box in the Cher family attic for, you know, years and years before finally getting unearthed. Um, and this recording sounds great. It's bright. It's a bright and tight set. Um, there's six songs total, including uh, Epistrophe and Blue Monk. So you got about a 45 minute uh, long running time. Um, and it's just a really fantastic time capsule of a release. And we'll have this in 24441. Next up is Suzanne Chani, uh, a sonic womb, live Bukla performance, performance at Lapsus. So Suzanne Chani is uh, an electronic music pioneer. She's a composer who is responsible for um, a lot of sounds that you probably have heard or are familiar with. 
Um, she was a very successful commercial composer, uh, but you probably never thought about their origins. But um, you know, she was trained as a classical musician growing up, and while getting her master's degree at Berkeley, um, she met Don Buchla, who um, had invented an analog synth, uh, which he named after himself, the Buchla. Um, it was a competitor of sorts to the uh, Moog synthesizer. And so, um, you know, she is one of the premier um, uh, Buchla uh, masters, I guess. So this is recorded, uh, was recorded at the Center of Contemporary Culture in Barcelona um, back in December of 2019. Um, it's just so experimental and expressive. Um, just a really wonderful showcase of an artist who has like such a deep understanding and connection to like her instrument or you know the machine she's working with. Um, and this will be available in 16-bit. And then finally, we have Matt Berry with Phantom Birds. Maybe some technical difficulty. Anyway, um, if you are like me, uh, your TV consumption has gone way up during this pandemic. And so one of the shows I have caught up on is this ridiculous oddball show called What We Do in the Shadows. It's about a bunch of vampires who live together in a house on Staten Island. Uh, so one of the main vampires, Laszlo, is played by this British actor, comedian called Matt Berry. Um, and he's also a musician. So this is his country-tinged folk album. Um, he's joined by pedal steel master BJ Cole. Um, you know, that's him playing pedal steel on Tiny Dancer. Uh, and drummer Craig Blundell, who has also worked with uh, Stephen Wilson and Steve Hackett. Um, so yeah, basically I wanted to mention this album because I like it, but I think I also really just wanted to give the show a shout out as well. Uh, we've got a bunch of Matt Berry's other records on Cobas, so check them out, check the show out as well. Sujan, as always, thank you. You are, you're just full of such great information. Um, so, you know, I don't know if you know this or not, but uh, every single time you we do this, um, throughout the week, someone writes me or puts something up on Streaming Music Matters. If you're not a, if you're not a member of Streaming Music Matters, uh, folks, uh, join us there. It's a Cobus fan page that I started a couple of years ago. It's just a lot of fun. We have just got a ton of music lovers there. You never see any anything outside of music. It's always just about music or about the about the gear uh, or about what we've got on 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 the playlist. But since you started doing these, it's it's just become a thing somebody at some point is going to go, oh, I've got, you know, I just listened to this one that Sujan recommended. Oh, I just listened to another one Sujan recommended. So this is becoming quite popular. And so thank you so much for taking, I know you've got, you know, an immense amount of work to do. So I certainly just want to thank you for being here and doing this a lot. For well, us. It's, it's my pleasure. And it's great to hear that people are enjoying this segment. So thanks. Absolutely. Well, we are going to say goodbye to uh, Sue Jan, and we're going to bring back in Mr. D. How you doing, buddy? Good. Good, good. Giant steps, giant steps, giant steps. Everyone go and listen to that. <laughs> Not right now, as soon as this section is over. Naima is one of the most beautiful songs ever written by anyone ever. So, uh, How would you know? You never listen to music. <laughs> That's such a great album. Okay, I gotta, I've gotta say something about this. John has is, is has started, I don't know, a few months ago, I guess. John, maybe two or three months ago, this this album review thing that you're doing. Yeah, yeah. Actually, uh, when COVID shut down New York City, um, I I did couldn't have any employees, but I have. There's as you can see, uh, I have two cats. Uh, this is one of them. This is Roxy. I have two cats that live here at the factory. So I was coming in um, to feed the cats and hang out and, you know, just do whatever I could. And uh, I just I I started a Devor Fidelity YouTube channel. And uh, most of the content is me talking about some of my favorite records, uh, which I absolutely love. There is not there's not one there that I don't love. Um, it It's just um, it's it, it's it's a great way to learn about music from someone else's perspective, which I'll always find extremely interesting, interesting, particularly if they're not a shallow person and, and you're not, you really get, get down. You. 
we just got, and if you guys don't have it, uh, we just added uh, a, a Devor Fidelity playlist. And look, you got to understand, I just started talking about this with John, I guess it was later, la late last week sometime, right? Or yeah. mid mid week yeah. last week sometime, and I'm going, John. Look, I love your your uh, your album reviews, and we need to put a Devor Fidelity playlist. Could you maybe just take a few selections from the ones that you've uh, that you've that you've uh, um, reviewed? And he's going, yeah, man, that's like easy. Everything you talk to John about, it's like, oh, that's easy. Uh, so <laughs> like within just a couple of days, John had us this. Um, uh, this this playlist, which I think when I say a couple of days, maybe it's two or three when he started working on it. I just got it last night and I got to start listening to it. And I got to tell you folks, and I don't tell you about this about everybody's playlist. I think I told you about this about uh, Andy Kerr from Bowers and Wilkins. He has a really, really cool one out. Uh, this one you are going to want to listen to, especially if you are like that. Uh, most people listening to this, or at least the people that are on the streaming music matters and Cobus page know that I'm kind of a, I'm a rhythm and blues, you know, thick soul kind of guy myself. And so when I started listening to John's selections, it just, just did me. And then he's, then he goes on into some classical and then kind of back out of that. But John, I got to tell you, uh, you've got to continue to add to this. Uh, because it's just crazy interesting, and it's it's not just interesting; it's fantastic music. I've enjoyed almost every single cut. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, basically, I I had no I just I the the YouTube channel is basically just me thinking about what record I want to talk about, and I've been. Um, it started out I was only doing live records because uh, because COVID. COVID shut down all venues. So there was no way to hear live music. So I figured all, so all the, the first half of the, the music that I talk about is all live albums, which is why there's a lot of live cuts on that, on the playlist. And then um, because of, you know, what's sort of happening in the, in the country and in the world, I started doing uh, protest albums um, and they're protest albums of, of all sorts. Uh, some really obvious and well-known and some sort of maybe uh, people might not have thought about them as a protest album, you know, uh, until you really sort of hear it in context. So, um, yeah, but I couldn't believe how many of the albums were on Cobas of that because I was just picking, you know, I, I think there was one of all of all the videos I've made, there was only one album that I didn't find on Cobas, which I, I was blown away. <laughs> I couldn't believe it. So, yeah, so every every track on there, is related to one of the videos that's that's up already, and every time I do a new video, I will I'll, absolutely I'll put it on the uh, I'll add it to the list. Yeah. So as we weave and bob between um, between speakers and hi-fi and 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 music, um, you know that's exactly what I want to do. I want to go because it's all related. It's all so related, especially when you have a, a crazy uh, big music lover like John. Um, so really, my suggestion is go to do uh, uh, Devor Fidelity on YouTube and check out these videos. You're, what you will find is besides someone with a, a, a really likable personality, you'll find somebody that knows a lot about music, especially about the music that he digs. And the way that he talks about it is uh, very personal, personable. And every single time, John, it makes me want to. You know, if I don't have the album that you got, which I probably don't, I I, put, I whip it out on Cobus and and uh, and play it every time. But yep. there there'll be a lot of music on here that you won't even know. I promise you, most people will not know all of the artists on these um, on these on this playlist or even the ones John talks about. So, you know, check John out. It's a it's it's a lot of fun. Uh, all of them are so. Thanks very much for providing. I'll, I'll look at that as a service. Cool. Yeah. And, and you know, for me, the more people who listen to any kind of music, I mean, some people, they like to listen to music a lot, um, but maybe they just, they're intimidated by the idea of trying to get into jazz or intimidate, you know, I mean, Giant Steps. If you don't know anything about jazz, just go listen to Giant Steps right now. I mean, it is, that's one of the quintessential jazz albums. Um, 
Okay. Or uh, you're, you know, you're terrified of classical. I mean, it's there's there's a lot out there, um, and it's hard to find out information about a lot of that stuff. It is. It is because there is just so much of it out there. You yeah. know, you you really you, you and I uh, are very similar in that. Um, anytime I've got spare time, it, which isn't like that frequently, but that that's what that's what I'm doing. I'm listening to music. It's it's so much more interesting to me than the the tel the television is. Um, plus, yeah. I just hate the way everything's being manipulated these days. Anyway, so yeah. my my wife and I we're just staying away from the 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 one eyed monster. And every night when she gets home, she's a school teacher. And when she gets home uh, after her uh, tutoring, uh, we sit out on, on our deck. We'll have a glass of wine. We'll just throw up a big Bluetooth speaker there. So it's not even about the, you know, overall quality of the music. It's just like right. I want music playing. It's part of my life. And that's Absolutely. what I've chosen it to be. And, and I love that choice. I've had, uh, I've had customers write to me. Uh, you know, over the course of the 20 years that, that we've been in business. But one of there's one that I'll always remember. And it was within the first two years. Um, so it was one of my very first speakers. And he wrote me this this letter. And it was it was he was thanking me for the hours that he sits and listens to music with his family. And instead of the television, he said that the that you know, the speakers drew him into the music and he basically the speakers went in the living room and now his now after dinner his family sits around and listens to music for a couple of hours instead of having the television on for those those couple of hours and he he, he thanked me and i was just like that's that's the best <laughs> that's the best letter i can possibly receive uh, i could not agree more i mean <laughs> that's great so that's like you know you've 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 changed someone's life. I mean, yeah. literally speaking, you. What I think Cobuzz changes people's life because once you start getting into this, into this uh, alternative world that we live in, mm -hmm. uh, you kind of escape from the matrix for a few minutes and just get into your own world. Yeah, um, I'm I'm hooked. I'm addicted, and this is the way I want to live out the rest of my life. It's just so much more. Uh, it feeds my soul. I, I think I could say that. Uh, yeah, and there's so much depth in there. You know, there's so much. You know, it, it's like radio is is tough nowadays. I mean, some some markets here and there have amazing radio stations, or they'll have one program where you want to tune in. Uh, you know, once a week with a notepad and write down your the stuff that gets played that you love. But once that's over, there, you know, it's really hard to find the music. So these streaming services like Hobas, it's like that's it's it's an it's a gold mine. There's the resources and the the treasures that are available to anyone who just is connected, who's connected to that vast inventory of music. Uh, there's they're in for hours and hours and days and days of of exploring and learning and broadening your horizons and i mean it's just it's so good it's an education and it's entertaining well thanks a lot for saying that yeah we're doing really good and and obviously uh since the uh the whole covid thing uh, uh has has gone on uh, although my heart goes out to so many that aren't quite doing so well um cobus is just we're just kicking along doing fantastic and uh you know, it. A lot of it is because we're just getting more and more great partners like you. It, it's it, it makes a difference. Cool. I think we. I think iron sharpens iron, and the more we can be with wonderful manufacturers, the more we're going to sharpen each other's points and uh, give people reasons to be involved or at least know the company um, or know that they have something. Uh, uh, really cool to offer one thing you may not know is i i won't really have anybody on the show uh that that i don't believe in their product so there's been a lot of companies that we've had on these shows that have been you know tiny little companies um that some of these guys go well you know well, we you know we've only got 700 people that are liking us on facebook but when you know people need to know about you um, right. And so there's a few companies that I seek out. You didn't seek me out. Um, I called John and I said, John, 
can you, would you do this? Cause I think it would be good for your company. And I think people need to know about it. And John obviously said, you know, hell screw yes. Off, screw off kid. You're bothered. No, he said, <laughs> get he off said, my lawn. <laughs> so John, tell me, uh, we, we've been talking about COVID a little bit. We've still got about 10 more minutes. So we've got a little bit more uh, stuff that we can go over, but you know, you're, you're not a conglomerate. How did you do? How did you guys even survive during this thing? What were your maybe some of your big biggest challenges that you had to deal with and maybe still are having to deal with? It was um yeah, no, it was it was a bad period. Um I know I know for the for the hi-fi industry in general, um it wasn't universally bad. Uh and a lot of people I think were were right in thinking that okay. A lot of people are home now, uh, way more hours than they would normally be. And so they're in front of their hi-fi system and they're thinking, you know, what can I do? You know, I've been thinking about getting a new streamer. I've been thinking about upgrading the cables, whatever it is. So a lot of my shops have actually done okay, uh, even though they've been shut down. Uh, we, you know, when New York shut down in the, um, all businesses shut down. Uh, there were no, I, I couldn't have employees, which is, you know, the, the lemon of the lemonade obviously was partly was my YouTube channel. But um, in addition, uh, I think with, with speakers uh, and, and hot, more expensive speakers, like what we make here, um, I think the customers really need to see them, touch them uh, and hear them before they buy them. And so our, our sales, dropped to zero for almost three months. So it was it was very scary for a, a while here. Um, but the actually federal assistance came to the rescue. Um, our our landlord, we we are in the Brooklyn Navy Yard here. So our landlord is is part of the city of New York. So we were we negotiated some rent relief there and um, and we got some federal aid. And so now as sales have have really come back up to what we would expect for a normal um, for a normal September. Uh, now we're looking at ways that we can um, expand a little bit, but also to kind of stabilize. Um, you know, we've at this point we've been around since 2000, so we've seen a few nightmarish scenarios. I mean, we right. saw 9/11. You know, everything in New York was uh, you know everything everything in the world slowed down from 9-11. That's right. We got through that. Then we got through 2008, where everything just collapsed. The financial center of New York City collapsed. Uh, and then uh, COVID. So, you know, I, you know, I, I feel I'm happy that uh, my little agile <laughs> company has has made it this far. And now we're um, we're really looking hard into trying to, you know, spin some good some good stuff out of out of all this uh, out of this experience. One of the things that we didn't talk about, uh, but I do like to keep it real uh, for people is, um, you know, we didn't, we, we've said, oh, well, they're kind of maybe pricey a little bit. They kind of are if you don't know what you're getting inside. Uh, I don't really look at them like they're, they're, they're crazy. I mean, people are selling hundred thousand, two hundred thousand dollars speakers these days. I look at right. what you put inside of them and, and uh, knowing that these are all you know, pretty much handmade, uh, every single one of them with the, uh, with uh, uh, 37.3% love, um, we go, um, um, oh, geez. Oh, what are, what are they, what are they, pro the price ranges? So like if you were just wanting to get into a uh, Devor Fidelity loudspeaker, uh, what would be your, what would be your opening, you know, what, what's your ante? Currently, uh, the Orangutan O93 is our least expensive speaker, and those are in the U.S. They're uh, 8,400 a pair. Um, then 9,900, and then you know there's there's several uh, speakers above that. Our most popular model, which is the one that was in Dan's living room for uh, for a couple of weeks, uh, that's the Orangutan O96. Those are 13,200 a pair. Um, so when you and I, when I, we've, we've actually known each other longer than we've been friends, I guess. I mean, we, we, yeah. we were acquainted. We're in the same industry. So, yeah. Yeah. But when, you know, when I really started digging you was, um, 
I guess it was right around the time that I that I uh, uh, pushed myself on you at. Um, I'm trying to remember that even the the. Uh, oh, when you came in, Capital Audio Fest. Oh, it's Capital Audio Fest. Um, yeah. So, yeah. so here, here's here's how John and I. Uh, that was great. This is when we really kind of started talking. That after that, uh, that that afternoon or that evening, we sat down. We had a we had a beer together, and we just and I and I just started going. Yeah, I, I like this dude. I can see why uh, you're 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 quite popular in in the industry. Um, and so uh, the way this the, the the way this worked is uh, a lot of you know that I do flash DJ sessions when I go to the shows. We sponsor a lot of the shows, and I go into some of the better rooms and the ones that I really dig. And I go, hey, you know, let's do a let's do a flash DJ session. So I'll walk into John's room. He's got maybe the biggest room, uh, which means like one of the biggest investments at Capital Audio Fest. And I'm going and, and he had these beautiful speakers there. And Luxman was with him. And I think they were playing their little their 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 highest end stuff. And yeah, you told me yesterday it was only like a little eight watt was a little eight it was watt a single ended three hundred B amp. Yeah, so seven eight watts. Yeah. That was so it. you would have never known this, right? Uh, and I certainly didn't know. I didn't even think about it. All I was thinking is, wow, those speakers. So uh, I walk in and I'm going, um, can I do a flash DJ session for you? Well, I had done one for the guys at Luxman just, uh, I think, the year before. And they just flipped out. They they couldn't. They were, oh, gosh, let's do this again. So I said, okay, you know, now they're here, but they're here with Devor, and I get to listen to these Devor speakers. At the time, we were listening to the Big Harvest, which are not cheap either. Mm -hmm. So we, uh, I get in there, and and um, and John finally kind of, you know, uncomfortably <laughs> says, well, okay, if you – if you must. I mean, it, it wasn't quite that awkward, but I could tell he was like, I'm going – if this doesn't turn out well, this guy will never talk to me again as long as I live. That's true. So that, I, that's true. That's what it would have happened. Yeah. <laughs> so I brought two pieces of gear with me. I brought an iPad and a little dragonfly. Now you gotta understand the system that we have this hook, this that this that's together here is probably that I, whole, I'm not even gonna venture. What do you think, John? That whole system was probably around two hundred thousand dollars all so it was about a two hundred K system. Yeah. about mid price where I usually go with these systems, right. right? Because I do this with all of these systems. So I'll walk in, I bring this iPad, I bring this dragonfly <laughs> and John looks at me like I've got 12 eyes. He's going, are you, I mean, I could see it. <laughs> he didn't even have to say it. He's going, are you kidding me? What is this guy going to do? So they, they let me hook it up to it. I could tell. So I put on the first thing, and everybody's going, wow, man, that sounds, remember the whole room was like, that yeah, was yeah. awesome. Yeah. So I'm thinking, okay, well, that's kind of cool. But I was looking over at John. I already knew I was going to do like three tunes. I wasn't going to be gauche and take out over the system. So I did my three tunes and and, and I look over at John. I said, like, thank you so much for, you know, let me play the system. And John looked at me and he said, oh, man, go ahead, play some more stuff. And you so we like, yeah. <laughs> no, for me, you know, Hi-Fi shows, I love, you know, I have missed Hi-Fi shows this year enormously. Um, but for me, Hi-Fi shows are incredibly fun. I love, first of all, I love meeting customers, direct meeting customers directly. I mean, that's amazing. Uh, it's the only opportunity, really, I get to do that. But I, it's, it's a lot of work. I'm in there doing the DJing. And one of my things is that I'm trying to play music, first of all, that most people aren't hearing nobody's hearing in any other room in the show for sure but just you know like good music interesting music that sounds great and so i tend to have to dj the entire show for the entire time so then somebody some guy like dave solomon walks in and he he knocks it out of the park with the first three tracks i'm like i'm taking a break now <laughs> i've got a guy who i can trust he's gonna put great music on <laughs> you know take it take it away dave so yeah no i was happy very happy about that and the speakers just I gotta tell you, they were so much fun to listen to. They're they're not, I would not call these analytical, I would call them life. Uh they feel like life, they feel real to me. Um, and to me, that is that's what I, I love when I hear a, a good speaker that moves me. Mm -hmm. Uh I want it to sound like life. I don't want it to sound like AI. 
right? Yeah. Your stuff just sounds yeah. like music. So you've done a fantastic job. John and I, uh, we were talking the other day, and as we're still becoming uh, closer or becoming better friends, there are things that we don't know each about each other. And so I'm going, John, you know, you you, you play any instruments? Oh, oh yeah, I, 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 I play. I'm going, well, yeah, I, you play guitar, right? Because John just looks like a guitar player to me. And he goes, uh, no, I'm a I'm a drummer. Well, I've got my setup right here. And he goes, oh, yeah, I see your DW's in the back. Yeah, I've liked it. <laughs> so we've got all of these really cool uh, uh, side things in common. Uh, which, which for me is, is wonderful because it's been, it's been really good getting to know such a, such an awesome guy. So really very much appreciate what you're bringing to the table. And we've certainly enjoyed having you on the show today. Thank you. This was a blast. Thank you so much for inviting me. Oh, you're, it's, it's our pleasure. Before we do end though, I wanted to, to ask you, is there anything that you would like to add that, that I may not have asked or, um, or just something that you would like to bring up about DeVore or any tips or just anything that you would like to finish off with? Um, not, I mean, we, we, we covered it. Uh, you know, the speakers, it, it's, yeah, no, I, <laughs> we, we covered it. The speakers are, um, as you said, I really try to make them lifelike. Uh, the idea is that when you're sitting down and listening, you're not thinking about your hi-fi at all. You're, you're either time traveling to a place and a time that doesn't exist anymore. Um, or you're being you're being carried away uh, to some other plane, and that's that is the the goal. And uh, I hope to keep doing that as long as I can. Yeah, I mean, and, and you really are doing a great job. And and I just want to let our folks know because we do have a whole lot of people that aren't necessarily as much hi-fi nuts as they are music nuts. So mm -hmm. one of the things that I'd like to to just add into this, just as a little tip, is if your speakers sound like two boxes coming at you. They're they're either a not set up correctly or right. That's b key. or b they they just don't do that right. It's like you got two physical boxes in your room, and and most of the time those two physical boxes sound like two physical boxes coming at you. Uh, yep. My contention is is if you if those two boxes are coming at you, if you hear sound coming out of those two boxes, uh, you're missing a lot because those speakers should be. Totally. When I say totally, I mean they shouldn't even uh, uh, audibly be in the room. It yeah. should be a whole wall. They should staff. be. They should be along with the rest of the system, but they should dissolve the that side of your room, and it sh it should not be your room anymore. And it should be you know you should be able to witness performances in front of you, or you know I mean that's that's what we're trying to do here. Um, and you know you can do it in almost. I'm I'm worried that Roxy is about to sit on the keyboard and change something. Sorry. Um, but uh, but yeah, no, that's what it's about. It's about the, it's about the experience uh, being beyond the gear um, and basically uh, being good enough to erase the gear um, and become a pure experience. That's a great way to put it, and a great way to end it. So. John, we wish you the very, very best luck uh, going forward through the uh, through the rest of the pandemic. Um, and uh, please come back and join us again. And if we can ever if we can ever do anything for you, I'm I'm certainly glad you're a, you're a co-bus partner. Uh, for those of you that uh, that uh, haven't visited John, you know, hop by on the YouTube channel or hop by on his website. Um, so everybody, I'd like to thank you again for joining us. Dan Matka, thank you for producing. Uh, Sujan Hong, thank you so much for uh, being here and turning us on to some some more music. I can't wait to go hear the uh, the new album. So um, thanks again, everybody, and we'll we'll see you next Thursday with Sonic Presence, which is going to be a whole lot of fun. Not, nothing really to do with hard music, but it's got a whole lot to do with recording sound. Uh, and now uh, with Sonic Present Presence microphones, yeah, almost anybody can come become a, a professional recording engineer uh, with just an iPhone or an Android and a couple of these mics you put up around your ears that are 114 dB um, signal to noise ratio. So they're like it's like real gear. 
Uh, stop by and listen to us next week because that's going to be a crazy fun and a really interesting, um, a, a really interesting session. So until next week, I'd like to uh, say goodbye and thank you.